to be honest, I've kind of been putting this project off because I'm a little scared of it. Let me explain how I got into this one. There's a little community ski area near me. It's the kind of place that's run by volunteers. Most weekends they get businesses to sponsor it so it's free to ski. It's called Veterans Memorial Recreation Area. It's the kind of place that's hard to say no to when they want you to help out. So when a friend of mine that's involved there asked if I could cut an internal spline, I guess maybe I've been watching too many Rustinox videos, and I said, yeah, I should be able to do that on the Shaper. So this is a pump that was donated to them that they want to use for doing a small snowmaking system. The problem is they don't have the coupler to attach the pump to the motor. I'm not entirely convinced this motor was ever actually attached to this pump, but now I need to make it work. The shaft on the pump is a 5 8 hex, and the motor has a 15 spline shaft. So I just need a coupler to attach those together. I should be able to do that all in the shaper, but I have some tooling I need to build. This is a random scrap and I've actually got two taps this size. This one seems a little sharper. That is just a really big tap to push in there. That drill bit immediately started walking off to the side a little bit. Let's see if we can salvage this. That came through pretty close to square to the piece, but it's not square enough for this. You know what? This is dumb. This is probably not going to be the last one of these I make either.
tempered this thing. Now I'm grinding it to final size, being really careful to take the same amount off of each side. In retrospect, I probably should have just made it to final size before I hardened it. Well, now I have a tool I can cut internal features with, but since that square brooch worked so well, I decided, hey, why not make a hex brooch? And I got this far before I screwed up. I set this up with an indicator on it to make sure I wasn't deflecting it when I was clamping it down, and cut two sides of it. Got it right on dimension here, but it's about eight thousandths under on this end. What I didn't check was to make sure this was actually sitting straight before I clamped this down. But the thing about a brooch like this is really only the last tooth needs to be exactly on dimension. So if I put the last tooth over here, it should still be salvageable. And I'm just going to go back and make sure that the other four sides of it are actually on dimension. Well, that went pretty terribly. I could not get this consistently on size. It's all actually a little undersized. When I did the other half of it, I left it oversized so that I can go back and grind this parallel and to size. Because right now, nothing is parallel, nothing is to size. But I'm going to keep seeing this through till it's inevitable failure, because I think it will still work. The way to think about this is everything up to the last tooth is essentially roughing and that last tooth is going to set the final shape. And I actually need to make this in two pieces anyway so that it will fit in my arbor press. So what I'm going to do now is go and actually grind this part so it's at least parallel for now and still leave it a little oversized. Got this section fairly well trued up, it's still oversized. Again, I'm going to grind afterwards because in retrospect, I do like doing it that way. Did the math here, I'm going between two and three thousandths on each tooth. Tooth spacing works out. Uh, 60 thousandths between teeth. I don't have a DRO, but I do have this kind of comically large and yet awesome 4-inch travel indicator. I'll have to move it a couple times. Tooth spacing doesn't have to be real precise, but this will help me keep track of it a little easier. Of course, there's one more tooth I need to do back here that I can't get to because of the jaws of the chuck, but we'll figure that out later.
tempered this and then ground the first three sides of it. Before I started, I measured it and then measured it afterwards so I know how much I need to take off the other three sides to keep it even. Got about six thousandths to go. So somewhere in this process, I probably took more off of one side than the other, so it's probably not a perfectly regular hex. So what I'm looking at is kind of where the parts that are turned is breaking on there to decide if I need to take more off of one side or another to even it out. If everything is even, that circle is perfectly circumscribed around that hex. right where it should be. I made three of these blanks, two out of aluminum to kind of get my numbers dialed in and then test them and then the real one will be made out of 304 stainless. 303 stainless would be easier to machine but I had a piece of 304 and nah, I'm a glutton for punishment. One of the mistakes I made on this is these flutes really get packed out. I should have made those deeper so there was room for the chips, especially going through something that long. So I kind of need to back it out occasionally and clear that out. I don't want to drag these back in. Well, I got this one to the point where it won't go forward and it won't go backward. Oh. I guess all that's left to do now is try the real one. Got a whole bunch of anchor lube on there. Let's see how this goes. Well, that was a struggle, but the result's what really matters, and those came out pretty good. Because this piece was a little undersized, when I hit the first tooth on this one, it was really hard to push that through. Once I got that broken through, it went pretty well. Asking a lot of that little arbor press, probably a little too much, but got it done. Of course I need some way to hold these things now, so I'm just knocking up a little hex mandrel. Since I struggled with the collet blocks before, I figured I'd try and do it in the spindexer this time. So this is where this gets a little wonky. This shaft measures at 986, so that's either 63 60 fourths or 25 millimeters. It's pretty much right on either. With 15 splines, it doesn't work out to be a standard pitch or module in either metric or SAE. So I don't know what that spline is actually supposed to be. 
to complicate things even more, you basically have three different ways that splines will fit together. You'll either have them bearing on the outside diameter, the inside diameter, which is not very common, or kind of on the sides. And so kind of looking at the wear on this and where there's rust, it looks like this is probably a side fit. It's kind of fitting right along there on each one. Honestly, for the way I'm doing this, I don't really need to know what the standard of this is because I'm just making a piece that fits this. So just looking through the formulas in here, if I look at internal splines, my minor diameter for a sliding fit, you want it one and a half thousandths over with a tolerance of about two thousandths. So we'll just leave a little extra space. Of course, being 15 splines, when you measure between two, you're not measuring straight across, so I'm gonna have to figure out some math here. I'm sure there's a good way to do this mathematically, but I just drew up in CAD a 15-sided polygon, scaled it for the measurements I took, checked some of the other points that I also measured, came up with 8, 10, and change. With our clearance, let's go 8, 12. And the last thing I need to do is cut a little groove so the shaper tool has somewhere to run out. Now I just need to grind a tool bit to match the profile of the teeth of the spline. But I don't think it's really going to be practical to try to grind it to match this. We'll just get a little mold release on here. I need something that's the negative of that, basically what I want to cut out. Involute splines come in 30 degree, 37 and a half, and 45 degrees. And I'm trying to just kind of eyeball what this is, because if I can just grind a trapezoidal tool to that angle, it's a pretty good starting point to get it dialed in. It looks like it's 37 and a half. Yeah, it might be 45. So, what I just said there was actually completely wrong because it's actually the pressure angle, not the included angle, that's 45 degrees. I spent a long time trying to work out the geometry of what the spline should be with some online spline generators. Didn't really get anywhere with that other than figuring out it's probably a 30 degree spline because that's the most common one. But none of that really matters because all we're doing is fitting this to that. So grinding this to 45 degree included angle actually got it pretty darn close. And so what I'm doing here is using my phone with just an overexposed picture of a piece of paper as sort of a light box and the little magnifier. And I think it's close enough that I can actually just finish it with the stone. Well, that is not perfect, but it's probably about as good as I can do. And I think it's going to be good enough. So I shortened up the stroke on the shaper, moved the ram all the way back, and now at the end of the stroke, it's ending right there, which is not going to work. So I'm going to try to shift the spindex. I'd rather have it in a little bit more, but that ought to work. Give me a little bit of room to cheat this in or cheat the tool forward. So now I've got the spindexer centered up, at least on the side to side on the tool. It doesn't eat up and down really. I'm going to set my stroke so that the tool holder won't hit the end of the hex arbor.
but it certainly looks the part. It's not even close to fitting though. Well, I got that to the point where it is a close fit, I would say. So for this, I just kind of kept cutting a little by little until I got it to fit. I'd like it a little easier to get on there. I think I'm gonna go ahead and do the second test piece and just go a thousandth deeper. So, ended up with a little problem here because this first tooth is a lot deeper than the last tooth. They just kind of get progressively shallower as they go. And this tool is sticking out the top a lot farther than it was when I started. So that just shifted up as I was going. So while I had the number on the dial carefully dialed in, it doesn't really mean anything now. So I basically need to touch off in the bottom of that first tooth that I cut. That's going to be really hard to do. So what I've got is I've got the indicator on the clapper box here. I'm going to come down and when that tool hits the bottom, it's going to start moving the clapper box up. I should be able to see it on the indicator. I'm going to back off a couple thousandths, which conveniently puts that right on zero. And then I'll cut it, test fit, repeat. Test fit number three, close. Test fit number four, number five, super close. Round six, seven, I think that would tap on there. Two thousandths at a time, round eight. That is the fit that I want. I think that's enough practice rounds. It's game time. That was kind of a tough thing to get the camera in a position where I could still see what I was doing, so I didn't video a whole lot of it. I did two more passes of one thousandths each. I call that a really good close fit. Might want it a little looser, but I think I'm going to leave it there. It turns out this needs to sit back down in that inner recess a little bit, and it's just a little too big. I 
I do need to swap that out for a stainless set screw. Well, you can just barely see it down in there. It's all together. There also needs to be a shaft collar on the other end here, so just knocked one of those up. Same procedures as before. And now you can watch the back of my hands as I put this in there. Well, that was a challenging project, but I'm really impressed with how that came out. My only real regret on this one is no one's ever going to see that. But at least I've got this one that I can set on a shelf and look at from time to time. I hope you enjoyed that, and if you want to see more like that, stick around, and maybe consider supporting me on Patreon.